This is Inside the Tour in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. I'm Alistair Eakin, Lions fanatic and rugby commentator. I plan to stay connected to this summer's tour with the official Lions app powered by Vodafone. Hello, it's episode four of Inside the Tour. We're at Inside Tour Pod on social. Beware, there is a little bit of swearing in this, but we're getting in the mood for this summer's Lions adventure in South Africa. I always remember turning and then seeing South Africa run out. I've never seen a side run out like that before. I was literally like, thinking I thought they were going to run through the stand the other side. I thought that's how hard they were running out and that's how much they wanted this game. And <laughs> it was incredible, really. I was always thinking, wow, well, I think it's, it's going to be a test match today, that's for sure. To be a winning liar, there's not many can actually say that, can they? It gives me goose pimples singing about it. It's a bit emotional as well. Hi, I'm Neil Jenkins, starting fullback for the British and Irish Lions against South Africa in 1997. Easily the best tour I've ever been on. Inside the tour. A makeshift fullback, but what a role he went on to play on the tour. Neil Jenkins is back with us on episode four of the series as we follow the British and Irish Lions on their infamous tour of South Africa in 1997. We've taken our time getting out of London, the call-ups, the training and the bonding. Now we're South Africa bound. I just remember being really super excited about the games, about the characters and about them playing against South Africa in South Africa. You know, even thinking back to it now, yes, I was excited, but I was also slightly resentful that I wasn't there. <laughs> That's rugby presenter Jill Douglas summing up the feelings of all of us. Perhaps we all wanted to be Matt Dawson at that moment. Yeah, Virgin Atlantic, upper class, thanks for coming. This episode is all about getting those warm-up wins, earning a spot in the test side and keeping the ball rolling in midweek. A Lions tour in that regard is totally unique. The reality is when you go on Lions tours, it's probably the team more often I was remembered for how the test series goes. I always felt in 97 and everyone's given an opportunity and it's up to you whether you take it or not. And uh, so I felt in 97 was we were given opportunities. You know, I know the tour is a lot longer in 97 than what it is nowadays, but you were given a chance. You were given a chance to play. If, if you imagine the games are played, it starts on a Saturday, midweek, mid Saturday, midweek, Saturday, midweek, Saturday, up to the test. My name's John Bentley. I was playing on the wing. Eight games in, it's a test. And everybody wants to play in the test. And, and that was clear with ours. You know, I was lucky enough to start the first Saturday in, in, in Port Elizabeth. Um, then, I, then I didn't get another start until Natal, so on, on a Saturday. So, but you always felt, because I was involved in the bench or I'd come on in different games, you always felt that there was, there was never, you know, it had an idea of they test 15, there's no doubt in that. But I think in 97, if you look at probably what initially you thought was going to be a test team and what actually was your test team, um, I think a lot of people would have been quite surprised. I'm Rob Wainwright. One of the aims of the management was to avoid a split, which I think had been well documented in one of the previous tours. And I, I would say that they, they achieved that, uh, and which meant it was, it was easy because so many of the midweek team, which didn't exist, there was no midweek team, so many of them then moved up into the test team as injuries began to you know, pop up here and there. Uh, and, and as a result, they, they slotted in quite easily. I'm Matt Dawson and I played scrum half. I remember in 2001, it was obvious from the very first training session what the test team was going to be in Graham Henry's mind. Whereas in 97, you had the, there were some partnerships, certainly Gregor and Rob Howley you thought, well, they probably are the form fly, you know, you know, when it's so, it was so glaringly obvious that that's fine, but certainly in the forwards, you know, the back three, there were positions that were right up for grabs. And also because of the environment that was being sort of implemented from the start, we wanted to win the series. Everybody wanted to win the series and everybody wanted to win any game that they were involved in. That when Whoever put the shirt on in every game, you wanted to perform and play well. And that's testament to the the management and the senior players who created that environment. We'd had arguably the longest season in history. I think in that 97 year, I played something like 40 games. 
I was so tired at that stage. This is Austin Healy. I'm Will Greenwood and we're with the Lions of 97 on tour in South Africa. We made the European Cup final, I think it was called the Tetley Bit Cup final, and we were top of the league. We didn't go on to win the league, but when all this was taking place, we were still top of the league. We played 48 games that year. Uh, 48 games that year. Can you imagine what the current health and safety crew would say about 48 games a year? I needed a week of just doing nothing, no training. I just feel, I feel soft. I feel like all my muscles are fatigued. I feel like I need a big break. I don't feel like I should be going on a really important tour. A lot of the other Leicester players, I think, were quite tired. I don't think Jono played much in the first couple of games for the Lions. He was given a bit of a rest. I was very conscious, uh, particularly with our captain, Martin Johnson. Fran Cotton, I was the manager of the 1997 British and Irish Lions. Traditionally, the uh, Lions captain always leads the team out in the first game. But uh, when we arrived in South Africa, I sat mar- <clears throat> marching down and said, look, uh, you're here to play six games. You're not uh, playing on Saturday. Your first game will be against Western Province and these are the games you're going to play in. He said, but I want to play. I said, I know you want to play. He said, but you need just to sensibly manage your workload and uh, obviously the number of matches you've played before you come on tour, we've got to really make sure that we understand the effect of that. So uh, we did that with Martin. I think Ian and Jim were very conscious about managing those players. But there's only so much rest you can give them. You know, they've got to blend into a team and uh, be match ready for the uh, the big games. But Martin was a special case there because typical Martin Johnson, he would have played every game if you let him. We took a tour party away of which some players would play on a Saturday and some players would play midweek and that would change throughout the tour and there would always be chance of change for that. But ultimately, every single person who went on that tour wanted to play in the tests because that's how you measured you know, so suggestion that any player was a dirt track was, was nonsense, it was ridiculous. We didn't have dirt trackers, we had players who all wanted to perform on a Saturday afternoon in the tests. I'm Keith Wood, I was the Lions hooker in 1997. The midweek side was essential, and the midweek side is pretty much essential on every Lions tour, to keep momentum to highlight individual skills that could be essential, to maybe play with a little bit more freedom. I See, I don't think you can make the view that you're going to be picked. If you think you're going to get picked, you then have to prove it in every training session and you have to prove it every time you go onto the field. If you make the presumption that you're being picked, someone will jump up and bite you in the ass. You know, that's, I, I, that's, my, that's always been my view on it. So learning from the other players for every training session, the way they do things, the subtlety of the lines that they run, the following lines, their their technique. The boys that were playing on a Saturday would be up on a Sunday helping the boys to prepare for a Tuesday. And the boys that were played on a Tuesday would be up on a Wednesday preparing the boys for the Saturday. So it didn't matter whether you're involved or not, you know, whether you played, whether you started, whether you didn't play, you'd be up getting going again and helping the guys that were playing the next game. And that was just unreal for me. It was absolutely unbelievable to see, you know, your people like Martin and Lawrence, you know, these guys are incredible players, like, but just go about their business. They'd up, they battered and bruised from what they did on the day before. And they'd, they'd up holding pads and helping the boys and, you know, giving encouragement and helping the team prepare for, for what's coming next. And that was just, it was just unbelievable for me. It was absolutely unbelievable. The lines that do well are the ones that say, okay, I I kind of, I can learn from this guy. I can can learn how to do that, whatever it is. You know, whether it's how do you fly hack a ball? How do you make a tackle properly? How do you get your technique right? How do you lift a bit better in the line out? Like, it's fantastic. You know, you get better every day. You're learning something every day. No one believes that we're going to win this series. But, you know, that genuinely doesn't matter. The only people that need to believe are the people in this room and the the families around them. That was the reality of what we were up against. We had to sort of hypnotise ourselves into thinking that, you know, we were capable of beating the world champions 
I think because we were such underdogs, you know, the, the Northern Hemisphere do that pretty well. The, the Northern Hemisphere didn't have a good record against the Southern Hemisphere generally when they're playing for their, you're playing for your own countries. Got hammered against New Zealand four years prior. And, you know, it was all set up that we were going to get beaten, not just in the test matches, but every weekend, every midweek game, we were going to be lucky to win a game. Well, there was a lot of fear going into the tour. There was a huge amount of discussion that this could be the end of the Lions. There was a huge amount of discussion that we would get steamrolled. There also was a an undercurrent of thought, not inside the camp, but outside the camp, that we were almost being lulled into victory because they held back the Springbok players. And once you play against the full might of the Springboks, you know, is this going to change? Uh, and they thought it was. I mean, it was everywhere we went, it was backs against the wall. Everywhere. I have to say, when, when people keep saying that often enough, you do think it too. Everywhere we went, we knew that we weren't going to get the right service or the right bus or the right training pitch, the right refereeing decisions. We were thinking it not in a negative. We were kind of using every time somebody said that as an extra little bit of bitterness for us to have when, it, when the big days arrive. You know, we just had that mentality of, you can throw whatever you like at us, we are so united, we're going to do it together. And then that started to build on the back of performances. I mean, I remember getting interviewed after a Man of the Match award. The South African correspondent referred to me as a dirt tracker. I nearly snapped his head off. I said, Mate, we, we haven't got any dirt trackers on this trip. We've got 35 players who want to play on a Saturday and are trying their best to do so. From a Lions perspective, it was, oh, actually, this style of rugby that Geach and Jim Telfer are trying to get us to do could be really effective, and we could have a bloody good time playing this rugby. This is decent. As well as all the social, all the midweek activity, local visits, the hospitals, the schools, the nightclubs, you know, all the stuff that we were doing, it was turning into, like, the greatest rugby trip of all time and then add 15,000 fans wherever you go. I mean, it, it was a completely new Lions experience. All our friends were excited. They were going to be watching. Susan, let us know where you're sitting so we'll know where to look for you. So they would be able to see Susan Greenwood from Ramsbottom. Travelling for that much from home, I got time off school. We'd so thrilled to go watch Will playing for the Lions. So there was... A great expectation from me. I was really thrilled. Everybody knew. I'm a great letter writer, and I think I'd written to just everybody in the whole world to tell them that I was going. And I went, didn't I? And I saw it all. Look, the fifth match of the tour was the defeat against Northern Transvaal. I I don't know if it set us back at all. I, I think it... Um, in many respects became the catalyst to a harder mental attitude. That game that we lost, I got into the Saturday side and I actually got replaced about 20 minutes into the second half. I was rubbish, absolutely rubbish. And ended up sat on the bench watching the remainder of the game. And it was at that point I made a decision that I'd, I'd perhaps lost sight of that it, it wasn't being about the rugby. I'd got the video camera and I was making everybody smile and laugh and little antics and what have you. And, and actually, it had to be, we had to return to the basics and it had to be about the rugby. And I could, be, I could have been accused of going off tour, actually. Sometimes you need to understand uh, how bad it feels when you lose a game. And we all know that and plenty of it, too much of it, really. But, but on that tour, for that team to know it, um, I, think it was, I think it was something. And... Uh, the reaction from that afterwards was it may have been the the the, the final thing that, that needed Jim and Ian to maybe go for the smaller front row or the, the less traditional front row. Um, and it maybe gave the extra element into us that this we were going to have to do things differently. We couldn't take anything for granted. So it felt bad, but it, we were there to win the test series. 
you know, and you just don't want to be on the team that loses, you know, and so that becomes something as well. I, I, I Like, it's funny because you're trying to think back, whatever it is, 24 or five years, but I have a feeling that there was conversation saying that, look, we wanted to win every game, but if we didn't win every tour match, it didn't matter a damn, provided we won the series. And the story continues after this message from Vodafone's Lions ambassador. Hi, it's Sam Warburton here, captain on the last two Lions tours. Ahead of this year's trip to South Africa, look out for Lions Live, created by Vodafone, bringing you closer to the Lions. We'll have pre-match analysis and discussion, plus exclusive Vodafone Lions content and guests from inside the camp. For more information, make sure you download the official British and Irish Lions app, powered by Vodafone. Hope you can join us for Lions Live. full story of the British and Irish Lions in South Africa. Inside the Tour. As a rugby player, me versus Matt Dawson. <sighs> just on talent, just on skill. As a standalone rugby player, I'm significantly better. Well, and I always got on very well. Very different players. But he was significantly better than me as a scrum half. This is Austin Healy. I'm Matt Dawson. And we're on the Lions tour to South Africa in 1997. He had the speed and the strength to be playing in every single position in the back line. But uh, I think the breadth of his skills lent him to being more of, a, of the utility bench player, which no one could compete with. I mean, he was the ultimate bench player, wasn't he? I mean, he could play absolutely anywhere, so gave the flexibility to the management to toy with the bench a little bit. Well, actually, in 97, I wasn't given the versatile tag, even though I'd played on the wing in senior rugby for uh, Oral, but I'd only ever been a scrum half, really, up to 97. And the start of the season, uh, 96, they changed the laws where they said that the back rows couldn't leave the scrum. At which point, I immediately went from fourth choice behind Gomesall, Bracken and Dawson to first choice because I could move those five metres quicker than they could move the first 20 metres. So the, the, the idea of being able to break from the base was gave me a huge advantage. And then I went from first, fourth choice through the ranks and then went to first choice uh, with the game against Wales in Cardiff against Rob Howley. Had a relatively good game until he sidestepped me in the last second to score a try under the posts. And then went on the tour as number two scrum half. You know, I knew I was number two. But when it came down to the absolute intricacies of playing scrum half and the game management that was needed under all of the pressure, then I think Geach wanted certainly Rob Howley as first choice. You know, in hindsight, had I known everything that I know now back in 97, would I approach the tour differently? Absolutely, I think I would. And, uh, you know, the way the tour panned out, the injury to Rob. Geet saw me as a more of a strategic number nine opposed to a, having all the bells and whistles number nine that maybe Austin had. How do you actually change that around? How, how would I have flipped it? How would I have I'd become the controlling influence as opposed to the fast maverick game breaker and that that's something that retrospectively you think back and would it, if I had changed it and had that knowledge then would that have changed the element of surprise that I had in games they knew they could put me on the bench and maybe not have to carry a winger on the bench which is what happened in the second test so I ended up being versatile but thought I would end up starting the, the test when Rob got injured we knew we were battling it out for the bench I mean, it even went to the point where Paul Grayson, had, who, who left the tour, but pre-tour and during the tour, he was the guy that got me to come to all the kicking sessions with Dave Allred because he'd seen that I can kick goals. And he said, Dorsey, you're going to need something else in your armoury here because if it's just a scrum half for the bench, they're going to go with Austin. You know, if you're battling it out for the bench, you've got to have something else. So I was throwing my sort of kicking hat in the ring there to say, well, you know, I can be your cover for kicking at goals to give you the flexibility. 
And, and that went really well. I think Dave Warwood was really surprised how good a kicker I was. But I spent, you know, and I continued to spend most of my career being the number two kicker behind Johnny Wilkinson and Paul Grayson. So I didn't get an awful lot of opportunity to kick myself. But I did loads of bloody practice. I genuinely thought, because I played relative well, not relative, I thought I'd played quite well, actually. I had a, my first game, I think, was against, was it Borders or someone? And it was in the pouring rain and the pitch was a quad mire. So it wasn't exactly made for someone who likes a hard track. And, um, and then I'd scored a try against Transvaal. And I thought, you know what, I, I'm, I think I've got a good chance of playing. Dawes hadn't played that much. He played pretty well, but not that much. He'd been first, fourth choice for England going into it. And actually, he was, he was probably the biggest bolter in the squad. Being on the bench against the Sharks for Rob Howley, that in itself didn't mean I was going to be on the bench for the weekend. But when Rob went off, it gave me quite, quite a significant amount of airtime on the pitch in a big game. You, know, you look back to Western Province, Natal, the Blue Bulls game, you know, those weekend games were deemed to be the test team. And I seemed to sort of slot in nicely. We got onto a good roll. We beat the Sharks well. We were gathering momentum. Coming on and slotting straight in and, and, and playing a Rob Howley-style way, I think probably cemented my position in that team. He was really Geech's take. Geech was the, you know, you get to pick someone. Warren Gatland always takes Falatau. I think Geech took Dawson. What could I have done differently to make sure, you know, we never heard his name ever in a Lions context? And I'm sure that's a plan that most people wish I'd revisited. The big game, the big game was Transvaal after the Blue Bulls when Bentos scored that try. It was important for the group, the tour. It was important for me. Because that, that, if you remember, we've already touched upon it, the Blue Bulls, when we played on the Saturday, we lost the game and I got replaced. And I knew I was back in the midweek side. And it was a massive game. Lost to Blue Bulls. In fact, it's until the third test that was the only game we would lose. Having lost, if we got lost and lost again, I think the, the guys who'd been hidden away by the coach, they didn't play the test team, the Springboks didn't play any of the midweek games. I think that, that that would have been the one. So so it was, for the group, it was important because I think we were playing Natal at the weekend and then we were into the Test Arena. So it was important we got back on, on track, really. It was a massive game. It was a, we've got to get back to winning ways. They really came out this hard and it was a massive defensive effort. We met their size and physicality like for like. We play a sport, it's a team sport, that lends itself to individuals to have special moments. And actually, when those moments arise, it's, it's, you've got to take your opportunity. And, and my world has always been, and I could be accused and be criticised for having a bit of a shabby defence on occasions, but I like the ball in my hands. And broken field running, probably one of my strengths, really, probably the strength. I always remember the ball getting hacked through and looking up, it got hacked through to... Neil Jenkins. And I looked up and there was a James Dalton, the hooker, and there was a back row forward outside him, about 30 metres away, because it had been fly out through. So before Jenks picked the ball, I actually shouted to him for the ball, and he threw it to me. Now, the first bit is, prom is, is planned. I swear that I was going to go around the hooker and the back row forward. The next bit, <laughs> I have no idea. I can see the big H. And of course, I remember somebody covering across. It was the fly off, I think. It was the fly off. And ended up stepping inside him and had an opportunity, would you believe, to pass to Jeremy Gusko. I could have passed to Jeremy, but I chose not to. He actually nearly tripped me up and I continued the run. Ended up going over the line with a couple of players, one of which had been the player who had cut inside and fallen on the floor under the post. Touched the ball down. Bentos scored that try where he should have passed about four or five times, which he's basically lived off for his entire life since. The tour was back on track. Undoubtedly, the, my favourite game of rugby, just in terms of the huge emotional boost it gave, not just the guys on the pitch, but to the whole tour. It became a crazy experience, really, because I couldn't sleep because of the adrenaline. My wife ended up getting contacted by all the press and what have you, and then went to the school where my children were at and filming us. She picked them from school, and it just changed. It changed a lot of things, really. I wasn't there to write books and everything. I was just a rugby player who played rugby. 
was never the best, but always did my best. Couldn't be accused of not being the best. But do you know, looking, looking on, it changed my life, really. I became famous. And I'd never been famous. Uh, but my wife does occasionally remind me from time to time. She says, I don't get this, for God's sake. You went on one tour, scored one try, and you've got one speech. Get over yourself. To be Transvaal, as they were called then, at Ellis Park was a real, real challenge. It was, and I, I don't know when it had last been done by a touring side. It just, it didn't happen very often. I think I come on at half time or early in the second half and uh, took over the kicking duties from uh, from Cathy, who had missed a, missed a couple on the night. And um, probably that was the only time then did I think that maybe I got, I got a chance of, you know, maybe starting a test match. That was the first time, if I'm honest, playing in that game, maybe give me the first insight into thinking, well, you know, I've got a real good chance here. Inside the tour. Game eight is generally when they announce the first test side after game eight. That's generally week five, and it's the biggest chance of the tour dividing. And the way that we addressed that was we recognised that that would be a challenge. We were asked how we would like to be informed of our selection, and we selected, rather than the coach sit there and read out the team, we selected that on the morning that the team would be announced to the world, you'd receive a letter under the, under the door. That way, in the privacy of your own room, you could digest the news, whether it be ecstasy or disappointment. I, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. I was incredibly, incredibly happy to be selected for one. Uh, obviously, when, when the time comes around, when the squad is announced, you, you're very nervous. You, you realise you've got a chance, but again, you, you're still not sure. Obviously, there would some names would have been dead certs on there. There's no doubt in that. But from my perspective... Um, I, I always remember um, the selection for the first game and being selected for the first game. Desperate to show my worth, really, on the tour and desperate to play. I think what was really important as well, which was a great decision, which turned out to be quite tough, we were asked to decide how we would deal with it amongst ourselves. And the way in which we did that, we, we, we decided that rather than the player who had been picked in form and all the players who weren't picked in that position would go and congratulate the person who'd been picked. So basically, when Yaya Nevers and Alan Tate, Yaya Nevers and Alan Tate had been selected to play in the first test, I had to go to both of those, shake their hands and say, oh, boys, really pleased for you. Oh, really pleased. You know, and not in that way, but, but basically congratulate them and wish them all the very best, which I did. I mean, I got a place on the bench, so at least I got a chance of getting on, and it worked. And nobody went off the rails. There was the, the balance between professional and amateur, wasn't it? It was, um, you know, again, going back to some of them games and being involved and the importance of being involved in the game and having a few beers afterwards, but getting yourself up the next day to get going again for the next game and to prepare the boys or to be involved for that game the next game. So whichever way it was, proper tour. Might not happen again ever, probably won't in terms of the way that was, but again, just... It's difficult, it gives me goose pimples singing about it. It's a bit emotional as well. There's a bit, you know, there's a lot of things that go on in your head, really. It's a, it's a special, special time for me in my career. It was easily the best tour I've ever been on as a player. There's no doubt in that, and maybe as a coach as well, you know. I was Geach would say, like you said, you might not speak to each other, you know, on a phone, or, you know, you might not be in conversation or see each other for a long time, but he always said more often than not, it might just be a nod, and that's probably what it is. It just might be a nod of, hi, hey, mate, how are you? And that's, that's how it is. And just you'll go back to a time when, you know, it was, it was very, very special for us. It was incredible, to be honest. And uh, I'm just very, very thankful that I was part of it and to be part of the Test Series, which was incredible. Nods and winks. Love that from Neil Jenkins. Maybe something's happened in your sporting life, either playing or watching, which you've shared with someone else, where only a nod or a wink is required to recall the day. Love to hear from you at Inside Tour Pod on social. This amazing tour is heading for the Test Series. But first, a real treat, our Geech and Jim special. Eavesdrop on rugby royalty in conversation with each other on episode five of Inside the Tour. I enjoy talking oh, with Jim. It's, it's like we've never been away. 
Oh, it's tremendous, tremendous to speak to you. Our relationship is so natural. Frank Cotton said, who do you want us forward? I said, Jim, before he'd finished the sentence. And it changed me completely. This has been a 9419 production for Audi. Alex Corbusera here, former British and Irish Lions rugby player and proud ASM Scholarships ambassador, telling you all to check out ASM Scholarships. At ASM, we connect rugby athletes with universities in America that provide sports scholarships. Apply today at asmscholarships.com for your free assessment to see what universities you qualify to.